Leben verändern. Liebe Kolleginnen vom Steering Committee 6, manche sind nur am äh, Stream dabei, manche live. Dear colleagues from BUA and TU Berlin, dear students, honored guests, dear Maisha. It is my pleasure to be able to launch tonight the international lecture series Critical Diversity and Gender Studies in the 21st Century with the inaugural lecture by Professor Dr. Maureen Maisha Auma on Intersectional Realities and Intersectional Diversity Studies in the 21st Centuries, Reflections from Audrey Lords Berlin. Erlauben Sie mir, dass ich, bevor ich Ihnen unsere erste Audrey Lord Gastprofessorin Maisha Auma vorstelle, ein paar Worte zu Diversität und Geschlechtergerechtigkeit in der Berlin University Alliance verliere, sowie zur Namensgeber in unserer Gastprofessur Audrey Lord, von der in Maishas Vortrag ja noch ausführlich die Rede sein wird. Before introducing our first Audrey Lord guest professor, Maisha Auma, please allow me to say a few words about diversity and gender equity in the Berlin University Alliance and about the namesake of our guest professorship, Audrey Lord who will surely be discussed in detail in Maisha's lecture. Diversity and gender equality is one of the three cross-cutting themes of the Berlin University Alliance, the other two, internationalization and teaching and learning. Diversity is inherent to the founding ethos and vision of the Berlin University Alliance. BUA, as we call it in short, strives to create a research environment that integrates the diversity of minds and perspectives that result from a diversity of biographies and thus depends on an environment that is non-discriminatory and inclusive. However, as we all know and some of us experience on a daily basis, diversity is not a given. So far, it is not reality but first and foremost, the name for a mission. The mission to make Berlin's universities places of belonging, where people can think, research, and teach without encountering prejudice, disrespect, and epistemic or any other kind of violence. BUA is therefore committed to promote a culture of research that is both respectful and thorough in its consideration of the widest possible range of opinions, perspectives, and experiences. It aims to foster an inclusive academic community in which we all feel equally valued, legitimately belong, and are supported in our intellectual pursuits. BUA will thus develop programs and policies that significantly improve Berlin University's records of recruiting students, research, and administrative staff from historically underrepresented communities. We will also develop structures that promote belonging and fairness for all members of Berlin's universities, but especially for those who come from academically marginalized groups. And finally, the aim is to create an envi environment that encourages appropriate, respectful, and non-discriminatory behavior towards all members of the Berlin universities. DigiNet, of which the Audrey Lord guest professorship is an integral part, diversity and gender equality network, will bundle existing expertise in diversity research and policies at the Alliance universities. The network includes a broad range of scholars in gender and diversity studies, experts and practitioners in diversity and equality issues from Boer institutions and beyond. The network aims to formulate innovative standards and catalyze cultural change toward a diverse and gender-sensitive, non-discriminatory research environment. The annual visiting professorship for intersectional critical diversity studies, which we are launching tonight, is part of DIGINET. By bringing in internationally renowned diversity studies scholars, we hope to strengthen 
both diversity studies and foster change towards an inclusive and non-discriminatory culture of teaching, learning, and research at Berlin universities. We dedicated this professorship to Audrey Lord and uh, were lucky that we were able to use her name uh, as a parting from this institution. We dedicated the visiting professorship to Audrey Lord, the internationally enormously influential writer, poet, scholar, activist, who called herself black, lesbian, feminist, warrior, mother, and are in turn very grateful to Audrey Lord's heirs, her daughter Elizabeth Lord Rowlands and her son Jonathan Rowlands for granting us the right to name the chair after Audrey Lord. We'd also like to thank Regula Nertzli, Audrey Lord's literary estate agent who mediated the process. Audrey Lord's first visit to Berlin dates to the spring of 1984. Dagmar Schulz had invited her for a series of talks and as a visiting professor at John F. Kennedy Institute at Freie Universität Berlin, one of the Boer members. Ori's first public lecture in Berlin, however, took place here at TU Berlin, at a feminist conference dealing with against women. The first public appearance of Ori was, happened to be at TU. Until her time in aktivistischen Zusammenhängen, bekannt aus Funk und Fernsehen. Und folglich die perfekte Besetzung für unsere Audrey Lord Professur. 4. November 2011. Am 4. November 2011 enttarnte sich der terroristische Kern des sogenannten nationalsozialistischen Untergrund NSU durch die Selbsttötung zweier der Attentäter. Die dritte Person des NSU-Kerntrios, von dessen stützendem Netzwerk wir bis heute nur wenig wissen, wurde zu lebenslanger Haft verurteilt. Enver Simchek, Abdurrahim Osudogru, Süleyman Tashköprü, Habil Kilic, Mehmet Turgut, Ismail Yasha, Theodorus Bulgarides, Mehmet Kubacik, Ilat Halit Yusgat und Michel Kiesewitter sind die Namen der Opfer des NSU. Ihnen gilt heute unser Gedanken, Gedenken, Ihnen sei der heutige Abend gewidmet. Und damit begrüße ich Maisha am Pult und übergebe das Wort an dich. Ist gut? Ich glaube ja. Perfekt, danke. Guten Abend zusammen. I'm going to switch into English. Good evening from the Technical University in Berlin, where I am able to speak directly to a small audience. And good evening into the digital global space, wherever you're watching this lecture from. Welcome to our international lecture series, Intersectional Diversity Studies, Critical Diversity and Gender Studies in the 21st Century. I would like to begin by thanking all four presidents of the Berlin universities, especially the president of the Technical University, Professor Thompson, for their support, which has been invaluable in securing this visiting chair and in naming this chair for Professor Audrey Lord. And I would also like to extend my deep gratitude to my dear colleague, Professor Sabina Haag, 
who is also the director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Women and Gender Studies here at the Technical University Berlin. Sabina, I consider myself lucky indeed to be able to share several intersectional feminist and gender studies work contexts with you. You are an example of lived inter intersectional solidarity, so thank you again for your continuous support and also for your friendly introduction to my inaugural lecture. This international lecture series inaugurates the first Berlin University Alliance's guest chair, the DGNET Diversity and Gender Equality Networks, Audrey Lord Guest Chair for Intersectional Diversity Studies. What does critical diversity studies look like in a post-colonial 21st century Berlin? How does Audrey Lord's influence echo in the conceptualizations of radically inclusive diversity research? How are marginalized groups who hold little social power, active agents in the processes involved in institutionalizing diversity and decolonizing white and West-centric knowledge structures? How do diversity workers generate knowledge of their institutions in attempts to transform them and to make them more equal? How does critical diversity literacy provide a new didactical frame? In this inaugural lecture, I will explore intersectional realities and the possibilities of intersectional diversity studies from Audrey Lord's Germany, from Audrey Lord's Berlin. My guest speakers are intersectional scholars and diversity workers who will offer transnational perspectives on institutional diversity, institutionalizing diversity research, and shifting power towards a more inclusive academy. I would like to take the time and begin by honoring the legacy of an intersectional scholar, a key epistemic agent in Berlin's, in Germany's understandings of intersectional social justice. Professor Audrey Geraldine Lord. Audrey Lord, for whom this guest chair is named, was born on February 18th of 1934 in Harlem, New York City, to Caribbean immigrant parents from Barbados and Grenada. She self-described as black, lesbian, mother, warrior, poet. She dedicated her life's work and her creative talent to confronting and addressing the interconnected injustices of racism, sexism, classism, and homophobia. Audrey Lord worked as a librarian. She was an English studies and black studies professor at both City University New York and at Hunter College. She was an author and a poet. She co-founded Kitchen Table Women of Color Press with Barbara Smith, Cherry Moraga, and others. Kitchen Table Women of Color Press became the first North American publisher for women of color. Audrey Lord was a member of the Combahee River Collective, a prominent black feminist lesbian socialist organization active in Boston from 1974 to 1980. The Combahee River Collective Statement of 1977 is a foundational text, a key document in the history of contemporary black feminism developed by a collective of black feminists in the North American context. Audrey Lord was a guest professor herself, a visiting professor at Berlin's Free University, as Sabina said, beginning in the year 1984 a century before the so-called Berliner Congo Conference, where the scramble and partition of Africa and of other colonized geopolitical spaces and communities was politically and administratively formalized in the Wilhelmstrasse, right in the middle of Berlin. Audrey Lord was a transformative force. She was a midwife of ideas for Berlin's intersectional feminist and women's studies movement. From 1984 until her departure from Berlin and her subsequent death, at only 58 years, on the 17th November of 1992. Audrey Lord died of breast cancer, and even in her life's crisis, in her death crisis, she poured her creative force into two forms of public communication, namely the Cancer Journals of 1980 and A Burst of Light in 1988, using nonfiction, prose, essays, and journal entries to bear witness to to explore and to reflect on her health journey and to grapple with West-centric and white-centric notions and ideas of illness, disability, treatment, cancer and sexuality, physical beauty and prosthesis, as well as themes of death, fear of mortality, survival, emotional well-being well and healing, and inner power. Audrey Lord's impact on the beginning organization of the black movement, especially the black feminist movement in Germany, was profound indeed. She coined the self-description Afro-German, Afro-Deutsch, 
a rallying cry to intersectional Afro-diasporic feminists, lesbians, mothers, poets, to join forces and envision another Germany, another Berlin. We continue in this vein, and we are deeply grateful for her guidance. Founders of the Afro-German feminist movement who engaged actively with Audre Lorde and with each other in the spaces created by Professor Lorde and her partner, Professor Gloria Joseph, are here in this room with us tonight. Audre Lorde's legacy is in this sense alive and a continued presence in Berlin. I will now move on to my overview for my lecture tonight. So this is my overview. There are four ideas which I would like to propose and characterize with the intent to map out the complex path which we are trying to create collectively with this guest chair in particular and with the DGANET, the Diversity and Gender Equality Network of the Berlin University Alliance in general. So these four ideas are that we are dealing with intersectional realities in Audre Lorde's Berlin, that we are trying to define and frame intersectional diversity studies in the 21st century, that we are dealing with a situation in which programmatically everyone is included, and I have um, crossed it out because obviously that is not the reality, unfortunately, looking at, at very uh, resistant barriers to participation. Um, and I am borrowing here from Sarah Ahmed's um, empirical study with the same title on being included, racism and institutional life. And finally, um, also borrowing from Sarah Ahmed's uh, same empirical study, I am going to explore and propose some ideas about how institutional diversity and institutional whiteness are connected and what we can do to shift and transform those relations. So this lecture series is located within and therefore situated in the debates, deliberations, contestations, and collaborations around institutional diversity from a hyper-diverse, post-migrant, post-colonial metropole, the capital city, and the federal state of Berlin. Berlin is home to epistemic communities working side by side, shoulder to shoulder, on intersectional realities and the possibilities of radical inclusion. Newer concepts of superdiversity and superdiverse cities and neighborhoods have been introduced by Stephen Vertrovec, uh, for example, starting with London as a post-imperial, post-colonial European city, and this is all pre-Brexit work, so it would be interesting to revisit the London uh, after um, exiting from the European Union. It's hard for me to keep serious when I, when I talk about this, but moving on. Um, Concepts of hyperdiversity, and this is Van Kempen, Tassan Koch, Bolt, and Kraftl, are looking more into the lifestyles, attitudes, and activities, and their role in constituting affinity and group um, cohesion um, across um, shared moments of lifestyles, attitudes, and activities. And this was also about hyperdiverse European uh, cities and it was thought in a positive way. How are we forming social cohesion? But we also have to talk about how this is negatively also coming into being when we look at the Brexiters, the pandemic conspiracy theories, and the anti-vaxxers, because those are also lifestyles and also cohesion styles uh, and attitudes and activities that are being created across um, the, the um, mega social categories. So these new conceptualizations are meant to um, deepen our understanding of diversity beyond just um, um, diversity as, as celebrating difference and celebrating people from different um, uh, contexts coming together. Um, it reminds, reminds me of the essay, The Complexity of Intersectionality by Leslie McCall, where Leslie McCall speaks about intercategorical, intracategorical, and anti-categorical intersectionality and looks at the different dimensions of how um, differences and privileges and marginalizations interact to create social worlds which we try to navigate together. So um, at the same time, there's a critique that is um, applied towards a, a less complex um, understanding of diversity, a superficial understanding of diversity, and it is being it, um, formulated within uh, critical race studies um, by Denise Ferreira da Silva, who uh, criticizes the so-called dear social categories and challenges us to disaggregate these categories. 
Um, the same work is being done by Jabari Mahiri around deconstructing race, so talking about the existence of racism, while at the same time speaking about how different attitudes and lifestyles and socioeconomic categories also cut across the lines of um, social um, of social worlds around um, uh, complex um, realities. Um, newer concepts of political intersectionality, intersectional justice, intersectional solidarity have been coined by him, uh, um, Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, who also coined the term and the theory of intersectionality, um, also by Keina Yoshida in the context of CRT, Critical uh, Race Theory Europe. These also point at the intra-complexities within marginalized social classes themselves. And at the nexus of critical diversity and disability studies, newer terminologies and concepts are emerging. So the concept of functional diversity has emerged, and this is founded on critiques of the polarized ideology of human function, which fails to adequately describe the diversity of physiolo physiological and psychosocial function from individual to individual. So this is scholarship being done in Spain by Romanach and Lobato, but also by Patson and also Tenenbaum and Merrick. So I will move on and touch shortly on the political, social, and academic exclusion of groups, groups who hold little social power. What does it mean to speak about, focus on, and recenter groups who hold little social, social political power? So um, I am borrowing here from the work by um, Iris Marion Young um, in her book of 1990 called Justice and the Politics of Difference, where she speaks about the complexity of oppression and tries to give us an understanding of how social worlds in a daily manner are being uh, restricted by um, barriers created around um, unequal social power. So according to Ari Iris Marion Young, there are five faces of oppression. These five faces are exploitation, marginalization, powerlessness, cultural imperialism, and violence. And then intersectional lives and intersectionality begins when groups with little social power experience one or more of these um, forms of oppression. I'm going to collect, connect this to um, a diagnosis of the so-called post-socialist condition that we're living in. Um, this is a diagnosis that has been mobilized by several scholars. Uh, I am going to refer to Nancy Fraser, who, especially in response to Axel Honneth's conceptualization of recognition versus her own conceptualization of redistribution as strategies to ensure diversity, equality, and social justice for diverse and plural democracies, wrote a book together, kind of working out these two positions and working out the strategies of recognition and redistribution. The post-socialist moment focuses on the social world after the collapse, the formal collapse of the Soviet Union, the East Bloc, or the so-called Second World. So here, the loss of mobi the mass mobilization of workers around the commonality of capitalist exploitation is the watershed moment. And um, after this turning point, it becomes obvious that workers are a super diverse, even a hyper diverse social class consisting of women, consisting of trans workers, consisting of subjects multiply oppressed by a gendered and a racialized labor market, which is also globalized to add to even more layers of complexity, um, to add more layers of complexity to the equation. So we're not just speaking of a social class homogeneously referred to as workers, we're speaking to intersectional realities that then become barriers in the workspace. This then emerges as a new challenge to mobilize diverse groups of workers in order to achieve both redistribution and recognition. This is where, in my perspective, Charles Taylor's conceptualization of the struggle for recognition understood as both politics of recognition and politics of difference comes into force. Not one or the other, not politics of recognition or politics of difference, but both. So the struggle for, for politics of dignity is uh, formulated in Charles Taylor's work as a struggle for equal respect. And the struggle for politics of difference is one of cultural equality. So the equality of, of um, uh, culture, meaning obviously the, the um, knowledge we need uh, to move through our day and make sense of our day. It's not this huge <laughs> light culture or, or like leading culture debate, but actually what we need to function. So it means that the social world is seen from multiple perspectives and that each of these options of seeing the social world should be equal. 
So again, this is where Iris Marion Young's Five Faces of Oppression emerges again as a reference for the emancipatory parts of stigmatized, of marginalized, of dehumanized intersectional realities and social identities. And then the post-migrant condition adds even more complexity to the, to the picture, but I'm going to unfold this uh, in discussion with the presenters in the following uh, lectures, in this lecture series. I'm going to just tease it for today. Sarah Ahmed poses in her empirical study on being included, racism and institutional life, two questions. She asks, what does diversity do? And what are we doing when we use the language of diversity? So I have used this to guide the next layer of my presentation. Um, again, as a sense of orientation, the DGNET, the Diversity and Gender Equality Network, has a three-pronged objective to advance intersectionality and diversity, to advance intersectional diversity in research practice, institutional practice, and pedagogical teaching practice. And that's also on my next slide. So coming from this framework, we have to also look into the deeper structure of what diversity is doing right now in each of our institutions. Sarah Ahmed cautions against the neoliberal institutionalization of shiny diversity, and I quote, if diversity is a way of viewing or even picturing an institution, then it might allow only some things to come into view. Diversity is often used as a shorthand for inclusion as the happy point of intersectionality, a point where lines meet. When intersectionality becomes a happy point, the feminist of color critique is then obscured." End of quote. Institutional diversity is unfortunately in many cases understood as superficial inclusion or addition. Diversity as a terminology and as a concept mobilizes a great deal of social currency as Melissa Stein also points out. According to Melissa Stein, and I'm quoting, diversity can be understood as legal compliance, as a demographic representativity, or moreover, as a neoliberal inclusion, end of quote. Institutional diversity can therefore consist of conservative, liberal, or transformative strategies. Melissa Stein formulates an especially harsh but fitting critique that normative conceptions of diversity, especially in the corporate world, can, lead, can lean towards the carnivalesque in their understandings of embracing and celebrating diversity. This in turn only serves the interests of those who are already centered economically, socially, and organizationally. Diversification in the workplace and also in academia is a result not only of the globe shrinking, of increased social mobility, it is also an indicator and a motto of changing social relations between the formally excluded and the formally centered positions. A more right-based ethos is needed, as Vetovec points out. Institutional diversity must deal with claims of the right to be visible, to be affirmed, and to be included. Intersectional realities of exclusion are ex especially pertinent in the field of academic, institutional life, research, teaching, and publishing. The concept of space invaders by Niemal Puwa refers to experiences of being treated as space invaders as invading the spaces reserved for others. There are immense social and institutional effects of being socialized into spaces of relative disadvantage. Melissa Stein points out that there are efforts on being, that there are effects, enormous effects, an enormous price of being predominantly situated in positions of service and support for those who are advantaged. And she's speaking about the price that marginalized groups are going to pay or are paying right now for institutional diversity. That's an unequal price. As Stein argues, and I'm going to quote, beginning of the quote, for the most marginalized in society, the only way to perform their selfhoods is so that the required ease of the dominant group is always retained, end of quote. To do this, marginalized groups in many cases have to render their space invading self invisible. This applies, as Stein emphasizes, to gay and trans academics who have to live a precarious institutional life or to seek alternative spaces. There are perils to nonconformity, Stein points out. 
there's a steep price to pay for challenging expectations of one's perceived roles in the institution and in society. For disabled people, this marginalized group is often constructed as recipients of charity on the condition that they accept their roles as objects of sympathy, or they are cast as heroic if they exceed society's, ableistic society's limited expectations for them. So another concept becomes relevant to critical diversity studies, and I'm going to propose that we look more into um, respect studies. So the concept of getting respect, this is Michelle Lamour and colleagues, um, getting respect while living intersectional lives and doing institutional diversity work seems a fruitful one to negotiate this dimension of institutional suffering and institutional diversity work. So getting respect and the, the, the core idea of getting respect is that marginalized groups have been marginalized because um, their, their exclusion and also the, the injustice that's, that's bound with the barriers that oppress them have been institutionalized. So again, it becomes the responsibility of the institution, and I'm going to coin Avishai Magalit's term, but he says institutions can become decent institutions in the sense that they offer equal opportunities, especially to marginalized groups. So we don't define equality by the perceptions of the dominant groups, but by the perceptions of the multiply marginalized groups. Um, so the concept um, is about adjusting relationships of stigmatized, of dehumanized groups to, to uh, public institutions on the basis of formal recognition. So these institutions have to recognize the groups as vulnerable groups, as excluded groups, in order to set off the process of getting respect. Um, I'm going to move on. Yes, it's the right uh, slide. I was disoriented for one second. So all this calls for institutional restructuring. This does not call for cosmetic additions of the excluded who are then leading an institutional life under the high price of being a space invader. This goes to the core of what the routines of the institution are. This goes to the core of what the leadership of institutions is. This goes to the core of the self-definition of institutions. So let's talk about institutional restructuring for a moment. It calls for us to move from fixing the excluded to fixing the institutions and subsequently fixing the system. This has been inscribed into the DGNET, the Diversity and Gender Equality Network of the Berlin University Alliance. If you look up the self-description, then there's this, this is one of the, the uh, main um, areas, objectives of the DGNET, to move away from fixing the excluded and to move to fixing the institution, which means institutional restructuring. Sarah Ahmed gives, gives us some examples, and she's talking about the context of pre-Brexit UK. So speaking about this context, Sarah Ahmed speaks about how policies and legislation become the foundation on which conceptualizations for equality schemes um, are uh, formulated. So um, she speaks about, and this is uh, coming from um, her study of 2012, um, she speaks about changing equality frameworks, and then she references the Race Relations Amendment of 2000, um, which then made it uh, an, an objective to write a race equality scheme and uh, made it a positive duty under law to ensure and to enforce race equality within institutions and also within academic institutions. She speaks about the Disability Discrimination Act of 2005, which again makes it a positive duty to achieve equality for disabled academics and uh, um, disabled people in institutions. And then she speaks about the Gender Equality Act, introducing gender equality as a positive duty under the law of 2006. And she moves on to speak about the, the year 2010, where now a single and comprehensive equality scheme is required. So this again is where the conceptualization of diversity comes into place and where we ask, how do we address the multiple and, and cross-cutting um, oppressions and exclusions without trivializing them, without making it the carnivalesque uh, celebration of diversity that Melissa Stein has so rightfully criticized. 
This is the cover to Sarah Ahmed's new book, and she will be um, holding her lecture within this series on the 10th of February on her new book, Complaint. So the most lethal adversary of institutional diversity is the normalization of intersectional privileges. These privileges have been characterized as invisible, as an invisible knapsack of provisions, as Peggy McIntosh's early work states in her gender studies analysis of male privilege, white privilege, and their intersections. And again, I'm going to quote Melissa Stein. Those socialized into positions of relative privilege tend to have less insight into the social dynamics that have created their advantages. And she goes on to explain their, the investments of privileged subjects in maintaining the exclusive status quo. And again, I am going to quote, the way things are is experienced as ordinary, normal, and ideal, end of quote. So diversity and, and the, the, the struggle to achieve institutional diversity can generate immense resistance towards strategies and processes aimed at redistribution of recognition, power, and resources. And Stein again points out that social, economic, and psychological rewards are amassed in the hands of the more powerful, and that powerful forms of the centered positionalities are able to define the outside other so that the powerful and the centered can retain their own psychological and material comfort. So newer analysis of privilege focus on white-centric norms and privileged structures and aim at shifting and dismantling the normalization of institutional whiteness. Stein sums her critique in what she calls subjectivities of entitlement, and she sees that as one of the main objectives of critical diversity studies to make this, these, these subjectivities um, topical and to be able to shift them. And um, this critique is also in the same vein as the, the critique of hoarding advantage. So I am quoting Charles Wade Mills from Political Philosophy, um, who in his work with Carol Pateman, who wrote The Sexual Contract, Charles Wade Mills wrote The Racial Contract, and together they wrote Intersected Contracts called Contract and Domination. And in, in this joint book, he talks about white opportunity hoarding. So opportunity hoarding is a term that's been coined by Charles Tilley um, in the late, in the early 2000s. And Charles Tilley was speaking more about middle class privilege and speaking about how social mobility leads to when middle class groups achieve a certain amount of advancement and comfort, how they close the doors behind them and, and, and make it difficult for the next social group to enjoy the benefits of advancement. So it's a critique to all of us, obviously. And then speaking intersectionally, Charles Wade Mills is looking at this as intergenerational um, um, wealth um, connected with whiteness as property. So Charles Wade Mills speaks about white opportunity hoarding. So all of this is, is within the complex of hoarding advantage. And Sarah Ahmed interrogates the relationships between diversity and institutional whiteness in her empirical study of 2012, Racism and Institutional Life, uh, which obviously she has aptly dubbed as on being included, so just another reference to that. Further, it is crucial to name the operations of power in order to facilitate critical diversity studies as Melissa Stein again emphasizes. And I'm going to quote again. Recognizing the processes that allow the relatively smooth reproduction of existing power relations, such as those that invisibilize the norm, naturalize the status quo, construct ambiguities, promote patterns of forgetting and remembering, render some things unthinkable, discourage envisaging other, other possibilities is all essential for critical diversity literacy, end of quote. The aim, therefore, is to transform dominant norms and dominant orders of whiteness slash heterosexuality or heteronormativity slash able-bodiedness slash middle-class privileges and, 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 so as to make our institutions radically inclusive spaces on all levels and not just on the precarious ones. On the precarious, precarious levels, we are good at, at making our institutions inc inclusive. That, again, means that we live off the support and the, and, the, and the work of um, the precarized, gendered, racialized, and post-migrant market. So 
to end that thought, um, I'm going to, and I'm almost at the end of my presentation, just to, to uh, give you an orientation of where we are. Those are my four points. I'm going to sum them again, but I'm, I'm nearing the end of my presentation. So um, there's, one, there's an, one example that Melissa Stein gives for talking about how diversity in a transformative quali quality can um, further or deepen our, our conceptualization of um, institutional diversity and actually um, uh, carry out the objective of being more radically inclusive. And she speaks about diversity again at the nexus to disability studies. So an example of how naming the operations, I'm, I'm quoting again, an example of how naming the operations of power has led to an empowering redefinition of a group has been the successful reframing of disability by the disability rights movement once recognized as an other social relation that affects people with impairments, disability can be shown, can now be shown to be created and maintained through the normalizing pressures of an ableistic society. The shift, the struggle for better lives for disabled people from discursive terrains of medicalization, uh, this shifts, I'm sorry, this shifts the struggle for better lives for disabled people from the discursive terrains of medicalization and charity to empowerment and to rights. So I'm now thinking about um, the intersectional solidarities between movements and between studies, areas of study. So uh, the intersections between diversity and accessibility, um, the intersectional solidarities between disability rights movement, disability studies, and BIPOC decolonial movements, and intersectional black studies. I'm thinking about how we need to interrogate those relations, what shifts are at work already, and what are we aiming to transform? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to touch on uh, last week, uh, Peggy Pichet is here in the audience, I'm, I'm going to reference your symposium of last week. Um, this lecture series was meant to be made more accessible to a hyper-diverse public by translating it into German sign, la sign language into Deutsche Gebärdensprache, DGS. The relations between audio language culture as a dominant culture, um, as a dominant and a restricting culture, and the possibilities of intersectional translation teams um, are indeed being reconfigured and and uh, um, being um, yeah being put into into new relations. So last week's symposium by Peggy Pischer uh, and her colleagues, Peggy, as I said, you're here in the room. Uh, you organized uh, the symposium. Um, from the new chapter of the Federal Agency for Civic Education, the Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung in German. And uh, this new chapter, the third chapter, is uh, based in Gera, in Thuringia, in Thuringen. And um, your focus was on the related concepts of DID, as you call it, diversity, intersectionality, and decolonization. The symposium itself didn't take place in Gera, it took part in Erfurt, so another east location. And at this sym symposium, there was an example of how a translation team of three BIPOC DGS translators working together for the first time actually made this, this uh, um, conference and the idea of diversity and radical inclusivity, even for those who are completely in the, within the normalization of um, audio language to um, open up their perspectives to what we miss when, when we only concentrate and when we only center audio language. So that's one, one model, that's, that's one way of, of working with intersectional um, um, DGS translate, translator teams. And um, it's a model that, that I think would also make sense on the level of intersectional solidarities to actually work more on. It makes knowledge production more accessible to a hyper-diverse public and it shifts the way we think in, in ableistic normalized times. So I am obviously, uh, um, uh, uh, not obviously, but I, am, I have ableistic privilege and I am very set in the ways of um, audio language. So being at your symposium, attending your symposium and seeing these layers of intersectionality made me rethink what that means for radical inclusivity and for um, institutional diversity. 
Securing translation from English into German sign language requires a deeper knowledge of the epistemic communities advancing deaf culture in German-speaking countries. It's a reflection of our institution's lack of knowledge of those epistemic communities that it was not possible to secure the provision of DGS translation for this lecture series. So we are working on solutions. We will require the expertise, also advice and network information from disability studies, from disability rights movements, um, for movements for independent living to be able to do better. We hope to be able to subtitle the entire series so that while we are unable to share this knowledge with deaf intersectional diversity workers, researchers, academics in real time, this knowledge will be accessible afterwards. It is not ideal. It is a reflection of the work we still have to do. And this is one example because there's still other barriers that are also relevant. And uh, we start somewhere. We, we, we can't name all barriers at the same time, but we can always do the best that we can at this point. So um, there, there will be other barriers to contend with. And it's a reflection of the work we still have to do. The objectives we still have to accomplish. We have to interrogate, to shift, and to transform those barriers which make disabled academics, disabled lives unintelligible to the routines of our institutions and make the routines of our institutions unintelligible to, dis to disabled epistemic communities. We have to interrogate, to shift, and to transform those barriers which make queer lives, working class lives, black lives, unintelligible to the routines of our institutions. We have to keep challenging the restrictive, non-diverse body politics and geopolitics of knowledge and power. So from Audrey Lord to Sarah Ahmed and to Pamela Dube, to Zeynep Gambetti, to Maya Anboga, to Iola Solanke and to Siama Bilge, the scope and the aim of this international lecture series is to thoroughly examine the institutional culture of diversity in higher education and to redefine what a qualification in intersectional diversity studies means for the 21st century. I have included a reference of the images I have used tonight. Many of the images are from Deborah Moses Sanks, who is also present in the audience tonight. Thank you again, Deborah. And I would like to um, ask you all to please join us on the 18th of November at the same time, 18 hours CET, for Professor Pamela Dubes' lecture. Thank you again, and good night from Berlin. Hyperdiversity. Mm. <laughs> yes, um, uh, thank you, Sabina. I'm uh, happy to expand on that. So, um, what I was trying to do is that is uh, a productive irritation of what we think we know about diversity, uh, because diversity, the same as inclusion, is one of these terms and conceptions where uh, that have been so popularized that everyone thinks they know what they're talking about when we say, uh, do you want diversity? And everyone's like, yeah. And then we're like, it means transforming social groups and homogeneous social spaces to make them more equal. And the people are like, I'm not very sure. I want to have that process. So the term of hyperdiversity is more about um, anti-categorical complexity. And it's, it's more about 
talking about how our social realities, although we are positioned in uh, realities that are marginalized or dehumanized, at the same time, just by the, the, the concept of, of living in spaces together and doing certain um, activities together, we begin to form um, um, commonalities and, and actions that um, will in turn transform what it means to be, um, for example, trans or, or to be um, a person who, who is uh, disabled and confronted with barriers. So um, when hyperdiversity began, it was more about understanding um, the, the function of, of social space and, and how in cities um, groups in institutions come together and, and work together or work against each other. And it was a very optimistic concept because the idea behind it was that, um, for example, climate justice is a, is a theme around which uh, very many different um, uh, uh, socially positioned groups can rally around and, and try and work for their location to, I don't know, to, to um, um, work for bike paths or something. But what we are also realizing now is that it's in the same way that we are able to influence each other across lines we can influence each other negatively. So the whole idea of anti-vaxxers or conspiracy theorists or um, anti-democratic forms has also come up to actually show that there's a way of um, mobilizing groups into a commonality, um, for example, around rage addiction. So anyone who's, who's on social media is going to know the whole concept of how things can escalate in Twitter in maybe two or three uh, moves. So that, that the whole the, the concept of rage addiction is one, would be one of the scenes where, where you would explain how um, social discourse has been has been manipulated by using a, a digital media. I think with Facebook there was this thing about that the the, um, the algorithms have been uh, um, set up in a way that if you show an angry face you get more attention. So, so it's about the interaction of very different elements of social realities. And hyperdiversity is trying to show that, um, that the idea of social categories can be transformed by commonalities. And I'm going to say something really pessimistic, but this is also the reason why um, we would have uh, people of color voting for um, rightist populist politicians. I'm not going to name names and take this any further, but this is one form of explaining that. Thank you. Um, I'm staying here. I'm a little shy this, uh, this evening. Maisha, thank you very much. Um, this was uh, uh, on point and uh, uh, got me thinking again. Thank you for bringing back um, Sarah Ahmed and uh, her diversity studies. Um, and uh, I think about you know the the concept of institutionalized uh, diversity in spaces, and I think spaces as institutional uh, diversity, and that is also what we saw last week at the uh, at the symposium when we saw this kind of uh, ner nervousness, basically white nervousness in spaces when they are predominantly BIPOCs. And um, actually, right now, I got this uh, uh, um, thought that hyperdiversity, you know, I'm, I was never a fan of, of this concept, but it also forces us to think about hypernormativity. And that is something which I think, you know, what we find in this n collective nervousness um, of whiteness when in spaces are, which is predominantly uh, BIPUC. And we, we just started about uh, talking about, you know, what it means in this navigating spaces where we fight hard for to be not the only one, in, in, in a sense, what Sarah Ahmed uh, uh, tells us, you know, so we have three people and it's enough, and now we are organizing diversity around that. But then we have the predominance uh, 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 occupying the spaces, and still it's, it's a battle, and it comes this kind of nervousness, it comes a lot of pressure and sometimes it feels like uh, concrete is, is, is dropping down. So um, I think that was a comment, <laughs> a long comment and not so much a question. Um, uh, I think that uh, uh, Sarah Ahmed's work can also help us to, to shift uh, uh, towards this next step. And certainly here in Germany, we don't have that very often that we have this predominantly spaces. Yeah.
Thank you. Um, thank you for your comment, Peggy, and I would like to respond <laughs> to your comment. So um, I think one of the points you're making is that speaking about uh, institutional diversity and also what processes we have to put in place uh, to be able to um, secure a, a quality, a certain quality, an intersectional quality also of institutional diversity, that it means we have to dis dismant dismantle um, normalcy. And we have, to, we, ha we have to definitely interrogate norms and, and uh, talk about these, these norms and, and their dominant orders and how they actually serve to um, um, create a form of ease that is, is connected to um, disregarding privilege. So um, it's, it's an interesting and it's a, a point, but also a point of crisis. Um, because obviously the, the whole idea of embracing diversity sounds very palatable to institutions when they think it means we are winning something, diversity is a win for everyone. Um, and in the end of the day, it's a win for society because society becomes more um, um, equal. But the, the way going to it means that the idea of having been made the prototype for uh, um, the, the work model of middle class masculinistic, um, able bodied, um, white Christian socialized, I always say by Christianity, it's not just Christianity, it's white Christianity. <laughs> also, all, all of these elements are only an option. And the institution needs to begin to act as that those are an option and make them to an option, which means to make them smaller. They are a good option, but they're not the answer for everyone. And in order to be able to do that, we have to name them. So Melissa Stein calls this naming the power relations, which is an extremely uncomfortable process. It involves a lot of analytical and emotional labor, which again falls on the shoulders of those who are predetermined to be the diversity workers. So that's the other dynamic. And then the other point you're making is about, is about um, the idea of when leadership becomes diverse, that that again, is also a point of crisis for an institution. So it's a, it's a good transformation point, but it's a point of crisis to actually have a diverse leadership. And that's, um, so having BIPUC leadership, for example, having leadership by people who are trans, uh, um, um, LSBTQI, uh, working class, whatever, across those, those, those uh, who are disabled and so on, would mean, would require for meetings to have um, sign language translation or whatever. So all of these things come along with that. And um, it's, it's not a smooth path. And I think that's what critical diversity literacy is a concept, but also the concepts surrounding intersectional diversity are trying to point that out, that it's um, an extremely um, complex task, uh, but one that needs to have also very clear steps. So Melissa Stein has like 10 points that we're going to hear about from, from her younger colleague, uh, who is a BIPUC. Um, Professor uh, Pamela Duba is going to speak about that, so we're going to dive more into that. Any more questions or comments? I am happy to hear from you. Okay. Thank you, Maisha, for your wonderful talk. Um, I think it calls us all to think through everything we do. Um, I'd like to know um, whether you could uh, talk a bit more about teaching. Yes. I'd like to hear more about that. Thank you. Okay. Um, I can definitely say something more about teaching. So, um, I think there's a couple of dimensions about, about teaching, um, uh, about critical diversity um, studies. And I think one of the things is that um, there's obviously a divide between um, the hyperdiversity, we were speaking from Berlin, the hyperdiversity of, of students who are looking for a qualification in intersectional diversity studies and the teaching staff. So there's already that. There's already um, a moment of disconnect. And then we need concepts to uh, work around um, what does that mean to be, to be removed 
from the social realities, the intersectional realities of the people we're teaching. And I think we need to look at this also just as, uh, on, on many aspects, also generational. So also just uh, being, being uh, uh, generations away from, from students and the generation gap kind of <laughs> tends to get wider with the younger students. And um, um, also because I, I, I don't uh, um, have any um, care work with, with children, so I don't have anyone else whom, who can advise me on what are the themes, um, there's already that, that gap to be breached. And I think it's, it's important to have a conceptualization and uh, a talk about um, in, within the, t the teaching force, I'm going to call it the teaching force, within the teaching force to speak about these issues. How are we going to deal with it? So that, so that not everyone is left alone to kind of like devise their own strategy and then to try their strategy and then to fail alone. I think it's always better to fail collectively and then kind of rework um, what's not working. That's one thing. The other thing I would definitely like to point out is that um, the idea of, of intersectional diversity studies and critical diversity studies is obviously going to uh, give recognition to student leadership and to student-led movements. So at the same time at which we obviously do not collapse our relationship into um, a completely egalitarian one, because it's not, I, I come from a school of thought that does not believe in in giving the impression that we have a completely egalitarian relationship. We don't, we're in an institution, this institution is still very much under coloniality of power and knowledge and so on, and all of this is, is impacting on our bodies, on our situatedness, on our geopolitical areas that, that are kind of connected to us as well. But I think it's important or at least it's, it's some of the work I have been trying to do around diversity, intersectionality, and decoloniality to borrow from, from uh, um, the Federal Agency of Civic Education um, to, to use that more within teaching to speak about student-led movements and to look at them critically also. So it's not to, it's not to idealize them as the form and, and not to fall into this heroic concept of saying it's heroic work, but um, to look at it as a form of intersectional care politics, intersectional solidarity politics. And by care politics, I mean caring and, and giving care to our institution. Because obviously our institution would not survive if they're not, and would not be in the form in which it is if they're not people who would attend to that work. So I'm looking to, I'm actually writing more about that right now and looking more to, towards teaching that and, and learning together from that material. So it's our life material. In this case, obviously, it's life material of the students who are involved in the student movements and, and who at times are burned out or there are conflicts within the political group, so then they leave the group for a while or they cannot do their exams with certain uh, um, teachers because they have overexposed themselves, either foolishly or not. I'm not going to judge that. I'm just going to speak about the whole situation of being engaged and embedded and, and trying to enact institutional restructuring while studying in that institution can come at very many different costs. And I'm not going to individualize what the idea is. Just, just, the, just the, the materiality of doing that work is going to cause, um, cause fault lines. So to talk more about that and, and to use that more as material to understand um, um, the objectives of institutional life and institutional diversity, but also the barriers that prevent um, restructuring. So more in that direction. I hope I answered your question. I'll think about it some more, though. You wanted to say something? Yes, Danke schön. Um, I have to speak in English, I guess. <laughs> OK. Um, first of all, I want to say I'm moved that you are standing there. Very Thank much you. moved. Thank you. I said to myself, I'm not crying. <laughs> I also want to say respecting intersectional realities means also that we have to slow down because the pace we cannot keep. If you want to have inclusion, then we have to um, um, set the pace a little bit slower. And you said about the interrogation, the shift, and the transformation. And that would be my question. Where is that slowing down in there? Um, everything I heard, or maybe I heard it only on that ear, I don't know exactly, but we have to interrogate the norm. 
we have to speak much more about uh, uh, power relations and about power and white privilege. Our, also our privilege mm -hmm. as BIPOCs, yes. definitely. And, um, but what about, what do we interrogate when it comes more on a level of slowing down and care? Care is also something. What does it mean to have discrimin diskriminierungskritische Fürsorge? Because we need a whole lot, I think, a whole lot other um, parts in order to make that not easy pass. And transformation, that was the last point, is never an easy pass. We know that all, <laughs> me included. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your comment, Katia. I'm going to actually move back in my presentation. Can I move back? Ah. Yes, so around these three slides, that's, that's where I, I kind of, um, try to tap into this idea of um, what what is the price, what are the costs of um, institutional life from um, multiply marginalized positions, and um, what forms of action um, do we have, or what spheres of action? So um, the first point you made was about um, the idea of of facilitating change uh, takes time; it needs time. And um, that's one of the things that I think we don't really uh, have much in institutional life. Things kind of tend to have um, the, the idea of, of, of teaching a class that goes for one and a half hours and then it's gone. <laughs> and then you move on to the next class and so on. And uh, we experiment obviously with block seminars or, or trying to work differently. So um, I think what, what I've tried to do today was just propose a path and, and this was the path that I was, I was trying to open up to be able to have this discussion about what is the reality of institutional life from a, a multiply marginalized situation. And then to make that, that position visible for the institution and then to try and find institutional answers. So you spoke about this um, Kritische Fürsorge, about, about how an institution provides care um, and and uh, um, obviously um, provides recognition, but also provides um, ways of, I think you would call it um, more of developing your potential. So I'm sure every institution would say that they, they are willing and that it makes sense for the institution to, to um, provide resources for um, the members of the institution to um, develop their, 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 their um, potentiality because it then fathers the institution. And maybe listening to, to what you're saying, maybe that's the challenge to now um, make the institutions um, walk their talk and, and to say, well, to say that you have to, to um, you're, you're able to, to unfold your, your, your potentialities means for marginalized people that they need a certain way of being addressed so they're recognized as a vulnerable group. Um, that they're going to need to not be the only person. So that's also the other interesting thing. What do we do, how, how do we have policies in place that actually spell out discursively that's within now the text of the institution, if a person from a marginalized group is alone, this is what we have in place, right? And then I think one of the most, the, the most important things to me in this is about institutions, but it's also about um, all other spheres of life, is that when discrimination happens, when racism happens, and then um, uh, obviously being in the embodiment that we are as BIPOC, being in the embodiment that we are as the, the marginalized group, we are the person who's going to experience it. And then we're also the person who's going to uh, make it, bring it to the attention of the institution. I would also like to see policies in place that then take over um, investigating the situation, that it's not the person who now has the burden to explain and to make plausible that this has happened to them. So we need texts, 
I think texts, I believe uh, um, also um, Sarah Ahmed uh, spoke to diversity workers about her work, her empirical studies about following documents. That's what she says. She's following policy documents around. And she says there are some really, really good policy documents. And then something shifts. Then the, 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 the main government shifts. And then the document is buried for years. So um, I'm, I'm a believer in documents. And I think that our documents need to start reflecting the care that the institution is, is able to commit itself to. So I don't know who, I always think someone has to start. <laughs> it would be good to have someone who starts, a faculty who starts and says, this is a policy paper. If you belong to following marginalized groups and you're alone, this is the kind of care that you can expect. This is the kind of resources that you can expect. Um, if you're a student, you're a BIPUC student and you're alone in your course, this is whom you can contact. We do have uh, the idea that's going on in Berlin now about the um, diversity officers. I know in Canada and North American context, this sounds really old, <laughs> that we're only now starting, but we're starting right now to have diversity to diversity officers, and then um, um, uh, uh, officers who listen to complaints, but also to the situation about um, um, racist norms that, that uh, um, begin to play out in the institution. So racismus beauftragte, so on beauftragte for racismus erfahrung. So we are at that point, and I think that might be, um, there might be some documents to be produced there that can be followed around. <laughs> so I like this whole idea that Sarah Ahmed says she follows documents around because I kind of, I'm like that also. I like to find a document and kind of like look at the document and then I try to understand who in the institution came together in a coalition to kind of work on that document. Yeah, I think that would be one, one path, but I'm sure there are other paths. Yes, should we do one more question? One more. I think we can do one more question. One more. Two, over here in the middle. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Marisha, for your talk. That was, that was so nice. Um, so one thing that I recently found out, and I'm not sure if this was maybe a mistake or so, but I, I learned that um, basically the equality, diversity, and inclusion policies in Canada do to really exclude social status. So, so it's, it's only, um, so, which was very surprising to me. So for example, universities in this EDI um, policies, um, it's not about first generation academics at all. And I was extremely surprised by that um, to see that because of course, like a lot of these dimensions are very correlated. Yeah? So, um, so many, many um, POCs are, are, are first generation academics as well. And um, so, and it, it just surprised me. So, and, and, but you did include that. Yeah? So you said that basically we need to um, we need to think about that. And I very much liked. So, for example, care work is also usually um, not thought um, as as one really integral part of this. And I I just wanted to thank you for for including it because I think that's kind of weird to to leave it out. Yeah. So and it and it creates and recreates a lot of the power structures we are seeing. And um, yeah. So, but. Do you have any idea why it was excluded? Because that was so surprising to me. Or, yeah. Yeah, to, thank you so much. That's also a, a, a good point to kind of like uh, try and draw the lines together for today's um, lecture and discussion. Um, it's surprising that uh, socioeconomic status, but also working class culture is left out of the... Um, um, core debate around institutional diversity. Um, with um, Sarah Ahmed's work, she, um, and I have to read the work more deeply, but she has one part that's already super interesting about uh, diversity workers and diversity practitioners, that they work in a segment where they do um, a, a certain kind of labor for the institution that's considered to be a kind of labor that doesn't get high recognition. It's also a kind of labor that's, that's coded in a gendered code as women's work or something. So there's, there's also that, that, that touch that also, um, there, there are many different techniques of declassing and, 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 and kind of deprivileging and also making sure that that kind of work um, does not have the same economic dividends 
as a different kind of work. So I think that would be one element. And the other element, and I'm sure there are many, but I'm going to touch on, on two, I'm thinking, maybe even three, but two. And the other one is the ha whole idea of the post-socialist condition. It's the whole idea of how um, the, the struggles or the conceptualization of critique of capitalism has been polarized against um, the feminist movement, the intersectional feminist movement, and also against um, the um, um, race critical movement. And, and uh, um, it's, it's been polarized to a sense of um, there's this general idea of, of, of a critique of capitalism that's universal, and then there's the partic particularistic interests of identity politics. And I'm always like, show me someone without identity. If you have a reality, you have an identity. So I don't know what this whole identity thing is. <laughs> but it's, it's like the whole gender and diversity thing. You're a gender person, you're a diversity person, you're an identity person. So I guess I'm all these persons. Um, and it's, it's just, um, there's a weirdness to it. So I think that this crisis of the post-socialist moment opens up a renegotiation. It opens up, obviously, the whole idea when rage addiction comes in of saying, oh, uh, um, uh, you don't understand and you don't understand. It opens up that avenue or it opens up the avenue of taking time <laughs> to sift through the layers of meaning and to find uh, the points that we can use as a foundational uh, um, moment. So one of the th foundational moments is obviously the racialized uh, um, labor market, the gendered labor market, where care obviously has a different connotation than representation or, or something. And then the, the, globalized, the globalized labor market is definitely also for academia, also in publishing, and, and the idea of, of what journals would further my career in what geopolitical spaces as well. We are going into that territory. So I think there's, there's, we, we are able to move forward when we look at um, a concrete sphere and, and, and at one instrument at a time, then we are able to move forward. And I think I'm going to end by saying these layers of contradiction uh, they're also surprising to me, so I'm also surprised. Um, but the thing is also that in the um, in in the constitution, in the Grundgesetz, in the Landesverfassung, in the uh, we also don't have social status as a discrimination category. So for some reason, we are schlepping this <laughs> problem into into different uh, uh, spheres of social life, and. Um, in, in a certain way, we are, we, are, we, we are obscuring certain forms of social reality, but also forms of action to, to find a resolution to the pro problem. So um, I think this is why in the last year, also with the pandemic conditions, I have been looking at um, cleaning crews, the idea of, of post-migrant, of racialized, of gendered, uh, pre uh, pre precarized cle cleaning crews, who in many, many senses do not belong to the institution, I have learned in Berlin. They belong to, they're outsourced, and, and then there are time companies who hire them for extremely uh, precarious uh, uh, conditions. And these are things that we can address and start to shift them, not completely change them overnight. I don't have the energy to do that. <laughs> I'm, I'm growing older, I'm, I, I don't really have the end, but, but I think we can shift. And I think we shift them by also naming them and, and giving them a form, and then also giving them a document, a policy paper that we can follow around. So I really like this idea of following, following, following policy papers around. Sabine, I think we are at the end of the yeah. session. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Maisha. <laughs> I think you have given us a lot to think about for the rest of the evening and the forthcoming weeks. The next um, talk in the series will be November 18th. I think you mentioned it already, no? November 18th. Only via YouTube uh, channel, or only via Zoom, I think. Via Zoom, via Zoom only. So. Thank you for showing up tonight, for being at least a small audience in person. Be safe getting home. There's apparently a soccer match in town and lots of wild, uh, drunken 
males, they hopefully at the moment in the stadium, so it should be fine getting home, but coming here was really um, something in, in the U-Bahn. Um, but be safe anyway, have a good evening, and see you again soon via Zoom in two weeks. <laughs>